Hail stretch. I'll just stand up. Uh, so hi, uh, my name is John Carp um, or Jonathan. Um, I'm an active duty soldier, as Joseph said. Uh, I was stationed first. I was a medic. I deployed to Iraq with the uh, First Cavalry Division from 2006 to 2008, um, which is 15 count of months. And uh, now I'm a nurse up on labor and delivery at Madigan. And it's the experience with the latter more than the former that I'd like to talk about, because um, you know we've all heard the, the war stories. But I'd like to talk about you know the perspective that I see, which is more of the impact it has on the families um, that stay back. And before I talk, I should make it clear that. Uh, I wasn't expecting to go first, that um, <clears throat> I'm speaking only for myself. I have no official standing, no official status, and I'm not giving the, the Army's opinions. And secondly, that uh, I kind of have to scramble things, and I can't be overly specific, because I deal with people's health care. So I can't like lay out the whole story, and then everybody goes, oh, I know her, and then I violated their right to privacy. So <clears throat> what I see a lot are, is basically, we get it's, it's almost the same patient. She's 19 years old. She's pregnant with her first child, she's at her first duty station, and she's all by herself. And she doesn't know what to do, and she doesn't know where to go, and there's nobody to help her. Like, there's no one. Her husband's unit is like, well, it's not our problem. Her husband is deployed, and he knew what he was signing up for because everybody makes great decisions when they're 18. And uh, <clears throat> we're like, well, we're not childcare, we can't help you. So they end up having the head, you know, just helpless. Like, they can't bring family in, they're all alone, and they're stuck. And, you know, you, you feel for them and you try to think, you know, at first, when I first got there, I was thinking, well, they, they should make better decisions and the Army has its needs. But then you think, like, what does the Army really need? Like, is, is Joe private? Is he so necessary out at Yakima or at the National Training Center in Afghanistan that he can't be here with his 19-year-old wife at this moment? That we have to wait for whatever, I don't know, for the paperwork to go through or whatever. We can't, he can't come home right now. He has to wait. He has to do whatever to come home. And I don't know, it just upsets me. Like, I, I see it every day. I see it again and again. And I also see, you know, the, the dads who are, this is the birth of their third, fourth kid, and this is the first one they've gotten to see. And, you know, we're in the room at the C-section, and they have to leave because they can't take the smell of the, uh, we have this thing called a bovie tip that we cut flesh with. It's like electrocautery, and it burns it, and they can't take the smell. Because, you know, when you smell that smell in another context, it gets to be a pretty powerful trigger. And then they have to get up and leave. And... I hear the civilians being like, well, I don't understand why he can't be there with his wife. And I'm, I'm just like, you know, you, you're right, you can't. But uh, it's probably for the best that he walked out, and it's really depressing that he had to. And um, I'd also like to talk about, you know, so I'm, I'm a soldier, I'm also a nurse. Um, and as a healthcare provider, there's this thing that we do, um, that the IVAW does, uh, called Operation Recovery that we just started, or they just started, because I like, just joined like a month ago, so I can't really say we. Um, and... Basically, the program is to try to stop soldiers who are already psychologically damaged or wounded or injured from deploying again. And I really started to feel really strongly about this when I started to think about it because, you know, I'm a nurse, I'm a healthcare provider, and if one of my patients has, like, a horrible infection, I'm not going to throw them in an open sewer, you know? I'm, not, I'm going to make sure they have clean dressings, that they're, that they're in a healthy, safe place and can heal and can get their medication and everything goes well. And we do that with... with physical injuries, you know, we don't, we, we don't send them back over with, you know, gaping wounds and horrible infections, we let them heal. So why don't we do that with mental injuries? Why are, why are we sending them back over with these horrible, horrible traumas? Why are we sending people who can't sleep at night back for more? Why are we sending people who just, you, you meet them and they, they, can, they can barely function, you can tell they're just barely hanging on, and we just keep sending them back for more and more and more punishment. And, and as, as a healthcare provider, well, as a nurse, I can't, I can't understand that mentality. And I, and I read both in the news and as a soldier see our leadership trying to figure out why the suicide rate is through the roof. And it's like, come on, guys. Like, if, if we had tons of soldiers dying of staph infections and we were not letting them wash their clothes and not letting them bathe, it wouldn't be a mystery. Like, we wouldn't be confused. We're not letting soldiers heal and we're seeing the consequences. And it's just not that hard to me. I guess that's all I have to say. Thanks. About the policies, so as a soldier, there's, there's a, even as a, as a contented soldier, like I'm not, I'm not, my command is fine, I have a pretty cushy job. Um, there's, there's a disconnect between your command and you, right? Like there's a very, I don't wanna say antagonistic, like I don't look at my commander as like the enemy, but 
<clears throat> when when he's talking, I'm thinking like, what what are you what do you what do you want? Why are you saying this? So when we get a command directed anti suicide program, what most soldiers hear is, you don't want me to shoot myself because it'll look bad on your OER. Yeah. Amen. And so it's really important. I really wanted to echo what she said about about reaching out to to soldiers um, because especially the soldiers that are on the edge, the soldiers that are are feeling really alienated and are really thinking about killing themselves are the ones who especially aren't going to be reached by these command directed army army centric or command centric programs because they already think their commander doesn't care about them they already think that the command doesn't give a shit if they live or die so they're not going to be saved by a powerpoint presentation or a clever video or an online lesson plan or whatever other nonsense they come up with. I'm, I'm probably going to hear from my first sergeant tomorrow about this little spiel. But <clears throat> it, it, it really is something that, that we have to do. It's something that we as individuals have to reach out to these, these um, soldiers and try to help them um, as people who do care. Because just, just the nature of the problem is something that in and of itself, because of the way, because of the, it, because of the nature of the problem, it can't be solved with like a top-down command-directed approach. That's what I'm gonna say. Uh, you know, I talked earlier about being a healthcare provider and it's pretending that it's anything other than the fact that we keep sending people back into war. It's just, it's it's just deliberate ignorance. I mean, there's, it's so, it's like if you, if I ran up to you and hit your arm with a baseball bat and then conducted an investigation into how your arm was broken. Like, I know how that happened. We don't need to discuss it and investigate it and analyze it to death. We need to stop it. One of the great triumphs of my parents' generation's anti-war movement was ending the draft. To my mind, I, I can't think of a worse fate than to be snatched, to be 18 years old, dragged, dragooned into the military, and sent to some hell hole and killed. Uh, that, that sounds like hell. I think, um, I agree with the other concerns that, that uh, the, the Slagerman's voiced about uh, the increasing distance between the military and the, the civilian um, culture, the issues that a standing army presents uh, to a democracy, I think the answer to that is to dramatically decrease the size of our military. Uh, we don't need the massive force that we have. There's no, there's no need for it. There's no call for it. Why, how many troops? We have troops in, what, 130, 140 countries around the world? What the hell for? Like, what are they doing? What, what are we making? Are we saving the world? Is everything great now? Like, no, it, it sucks. Everywhere that we go, it seems to suck more. <laughs> like, let's, let's make it. Let's make it smaller. Let's make it tiny. And when you when you look at you, you look at history, um, I was telling um, somebody else here. I was, a, I was a classics major before I joined the army. Historically, you know, the Romans, they had, they had a civilian army, a citizen army, and then it became a professionalized army, and then it, it remained a huge army, and their army took <coughs> over the government. That's what, you know, happened with Caesar. Caesar was a general. He led his troops, many of whom had no real loyalty to Rome, but were loyal to Caesar, against the government, took over, and it became a military state. Because you can't have a free state and a massive military at the same time. It just doesn't last forever. Eventually, the, mil what, the patterns that the Slagermans are talking about where the, the military sees themselves as the experts in applying violence, the moral experts, and then the superior to the civilians take hold. They get tired of putting up with the civilians, the civilians whining about, oh my god, gas is so expensive, and taxes are so high, and blah, 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 blah. And so they just stop. They, they put a stop to it, and they say, oh, you know what, we're just going to take over, and we're going to run this because you can't handle it. And I worry that that's what we're moving towards. I don't know that that's what we are. I don't want to sound like a doomsayer. But I really think that the answer isn't so much a draft as it is just, just to go after the, the just massive size of the military. What do we need to defend the territory of the United States? I'd say we could do it with our intercontinental ballistic missiles and about a quarter of our navy, and we'd be solid. Like, who's going to come? Like, we can nuke you till you glow if you invade us, so just leave us alone. We'll leave you alone. We'll trade with you. You can trade with us, and everything will be fine. <laughs> Why don't we do that? I don't understand it. It makes me crazy. Like, what the hell are we doing everywhere? Anyway, I don't know. I, I agree. Do. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Well, I would...